Olga from Minerva. Today we're going to be making this beautiful blouse. It is View B from the Vogue 8772 pattern. This is an easy pattern and therefore might be a good one for um, beginners or confident beginners. The pattern includes six views and is one from their quick and easy range. Although this is a modern pattern, I think it reads a little vintage-y, kind of retro to me, and depending on what fabrics you use and how you style the finished piece, I think it could definitely be a great staple for your vintage wardrobe. Having said that, I think the star of the show is absolutely the fabric today. As you can see, it is a beautifully feminine print with lots of details. This is from our Minerva exclusive Viscose Chalique collection, and it is called Avian Garden. It has the most wonderful drape, and it feels so soft and light. The lightweight properties of this viscose chalet, when coupled with this gorgeous print, make it the perfect spring fabric for all your dresses, blouses, and even skirts. I used 1.9 meters of this fabric to make the blouse. You will also need some interfacing. I am using the Violin Vliezeline Super Light Iron-On Interfacing in White. It comes in a package like this, and it is very lightweight. For buttons, I am using the Hemline Round Shirt Buttons in the color Lilac. They measure 1.2 centimeters and have a wonderful textured rim that reminded me of a flower, which I believe is perfectly on theme for this project. I'm also going to be adding a Minerva Maker woven label to this garment. You can get this and other labels on our website. Last but not least, you will also need some thread. I used the Guterman Sew All Polyester Sewing Thread in the color 662. All of these items will be linked below so you can buy them as a kit, and that way you will have everything you need to sew along with me. And remember to save this video so you can follow along at your own pace. Before you do anything else, make sure you pre-wash and iron your fabric. To prepare my fabric for cutting, I always bring the selvages together with right sides together. This makes the process of marking my fabric later on a lot easier. And it's also a good tip if, like me, you keep a lot of fabric in your stash. This means that you're pretty shiny, beautiful side of your fabric is going to be protected from dust and from sunlight and yeah, just keep it more beautiful for longer. Prepare all the paper pattern pieces and cut them out of the fabric. We will be using pattern pieces one, two, three, six, seven, and eight. Print on this fabric is directional. That means that the print has a right side up. It is important to keep this in mind while you cut your pieces. Not every single piece will be cut out on the straight grain. The main body and sleeve pieces should all be able to be cut on the straight grain with this directional print in mind. When everything is cut out, transfer the markings of the pattern onto the fabric. For this, I used stitch marking. This is a method of marking fabric where you use long running or basting stitches along the pattern lines and markings. It is more time consuming than marking with pens or pencils or chalks, but it lasts much longer on fabrics and it is visible from both sides of the fabric as well. This means I don't have to remark my fabric later on, which makes the sewing much faster and much easier. I find it particularly helpful with fabrics like this chalice that wants to move around when I am cutting and marking it, as it greatly decreases my chances of making mistakes later. This is one of those techniques that get easier and faster the more you do them, and I highly recommend you give them a go.
A little pro tip for this is to use basting thread. Basting thread has a smooth finish. It's almost slippery, which means that it glides really easily through the fabric. It also means that it makes it easier to remove temporary stitches. Oh, and don't forget to cut and apply the interfacing for piece number eight. To apply this interfacing, use your iron on medium heat and leave it on for eight seconds. I always sew all my darts before I do anything else. To sew the darts, I first pin them along the lines I marked earlier, double checking I am catching the line on both sides. When I sew them, I start at the white part of the dart. I always make sure to backstitch at this point. When I get to the tip of the dart, I don't backstitch, but leave the thread tails long and tie them off a couple of times before cutting the threads off. For the darts that have two tips, I start at one end and don't backstitch, but do everything else the same. I also take the time to press the darts with the help of my tailor's ham. Taylor's ham is a tightly stuffed pillow that is used as a mole when pressing curved areas like cuffs, arm sides, dart collars, etc. It is called a Taylor's ham because it roughly looks like a ham. I am pressing the bust dart down and all the other darts toward the center of their respective pieces. Our next step is to turn the front opening edge to the inside along the outer fold line. We'll press that in place. Then we can baste across the upper and lower edges to secure it.
After basting, we can turn the cell facing to the outside along the other fold line in order to stitch the neck edge. So until you reach the square marking. Then we clip vertically to the square before trimming the rest off. We can then turn the facing back to the inside and press it neatly in place. The following step is to sew the front and back pieces together. To achieve that, we will first pin the shoulder and side seams, making sure to match the notches. Stitch the seams, taking care to backstitch at the start and finish of each seam. To finish the seams, I will be using my serger with matching thread that you can zigzag stitch on your machine. It is important to finish these seams as Visco Chalid does tend to fray. Final step to finishing a seam is always to press it, so we will go ahead and do that too.
can now start working on the collar. The first step is to stay stitch the neck edge. Stay stitching is a technique most commonly used around curves to avoid any kind of distortions. This is because curves are cut on the bias and the bias is, as I said before, the stretchiest part of the fabric. To stay stitch, sew three millimeters from the seam line in the seam allowance, usually 13 millimeters from the raw edge. Now that's done, we can put our blouse to the side and work on the actual collar pieces. First, we need to pin the collar sections at the center back and sew them. Because this seam is going to be tucked away in the collar, I only pressed it open. Then we have to reinforce the notched edge of the collar through the square markings. I sewed a straight stitch in the seam allowance from the square to the triangle markings. With right sides together, we're going to fold the collar along the fold line. Pin that in place and then stitch, keeping the space between the square markings open. This is where we will turn the collar right side out later. You can also trim the seam allowance and clip the corners. Next, we'll turn in the seam allowance on the notched edge of the collar and press that in place.
finally, we can turn the collar right side out using a point turner or a chopstick or any kind of dull point to help us achieve crisp corners. Carefully press the collar, making sure your corners and seams are where they should be. To attach the collar to the blouse, first we have to pin it to the neck edge, keeping the pressed edge free. Make sure to match the center back and all the other markings and notches. that in place, taking care to avoid any lumps and bumps in your fabric. Then trim that seam allowance down and press toward the collar. Finally, we can slip stitch that seam closed with matching thread. Slip stitching is an effective and easy way to close up any discreet seams that for whatever reason can't be sewn with a sewing machine. It is invisible from the outside and invisible or barely visible from the inside. This is also where I'm going to be sewing the Minerva Maker label. To achieve this stitch, slide the needle through a folded edge, such as the pressed edge of the collar, then pick up the thread from the fabric underneath, in this case, the neck of the blouse, and pull through. When I got to the label, I first sewed it by hand to the bottom edge of the collar, and then I continued slip stitching through the pressed edge close.
that our collar is complete, we can put the blouse again to the side while we work on the sleeves. The first thing I'm going to do is put in the gathering stitches at the upper edges of the sleeves between the notches. This is called ease stitching and it simply means that we sew one or more rows of very wide machine stitches with no back stitching. It is important to leave the tails of the thread long on these seams so we can pull on them later. Also going to reinforce the lower edge of the sleeve along those stitching lines. Next, we can cut open the sleeve along the line marked earlier between those stitching lines. This is going to be the opening for the cuff. Our following step will be to turn in 6 millimeters of the seam allowance on the long edge of the continuous lap and press that in place. I used the seam gauge to ensure I was folding in the correct amount throughout. is a really useful tool. It is a kind of ruler that has a cut out piece on the center and then through that center it has a marker. This marker can be positioned wherever you desire, so whatever measurement you want, and then with that marker you can ensure that all of your seams or hems are all uniform. Once both continuous laps have been pressed, we will pin the right side of the unpressed edge of the continuous lap to the wrong side of the sleeves along the stitching. To do this, you can position the sleeve so that the stitching we put in forms a straight line. Carefully pin this in place. Use a lot of pins if you have to. At the corner bit, it will seem like there is a lot of fabric bunching from the sleeve side, but don't worry. Keep maneuvering the fabric, smoothing the area you are pinning, and in no time it will all be pinned in place. We can then sew this with a small seam allowance, taking care around the corner. When you're stitching, take extra care around these areas, double checking that the fabric isn't lumping under, and rearrange the extra fabric as needed to ensure that you are sewing a straight line.
This step can seem a little daunting for beginners. It may take some practice and you might even have to do a trial run with scrap fabric, but I'm sure you can do it. Then we have to press that seam toward the continuous lap, trimming the seam allowance if necessary. After that, turn the pressed edge of the continuous lap to the outside over that seam. I took the time to press that in place before pinning it. You don't have to do that, but it does make the next step easier, especially when you're working with small fiddly parts like this lap. Finally, we can go ahead and top stitch that. On the inside of the sleeve, we're going to bring those pressed edges of the continuous lap together and stitch diagonally across the upper end. We're going to start stitching at the upper corner on the inside and move down toward the outer edges. Then we'll turn the front edge of the continuous lap to the inside so that the edge on the side of the pleat is on top and baste them together across the lower edge. in the sleeve, we're going to bring the small circle markings to the big circle markings on the outside of the sleeve. Then we base that in place and finally press it for good measure.
Our next step will be sewing the sleeve side seam. First, we can pin that in place, taking care to match the notches. Then stitch it down, making sure to backstitch at both ends of the seams. And then we can finish the seam. I'm using my serger again, but you can just use your regular zigzag stitch. Finally, press that seam in place. A seam roll is a huge help here in this situation. A seam roll is a pressing tool, much like a tailor's ham, but in a different shape. It is shaped like a long roll and it's mostly used to press narrow areas that are hard to reach, like sleeves or trouser legs, things like that. Before we move on to the cuffs, we are quickly going to ease stitch around the bottom edge of the sleeve. For the cuff, we will start by turning in the seam allowance on the long unnotched edge of the cuff and press that in place. We can also go ahead and trim that seam allowance down to one centimeter. When that's done, we'll pin the cuff to the sleeve with right sides together, taking care to place the markings at their correct places. The square marking should be at the underarm seam of the sleeve, and the circle marking should be at the opening edges of the sleeve. You'll notice that there's some extra fabric after the openings, but that is totally supposed to be there. Again, use as many pins as you need to safely secure the pieces together. Then we can sew that in place. Once 
Once sewn, we'll trim the seam allowance and press the seam towards the cuff. Now we will fold the cuff along the line marked earlier with right sides together. First we'll pin the edges together and then we'll stitch them down. The sewing line should roughly intersect with the opening of the sleeve. Then we can clip the corners and trim the seam allowance. After that, we can turn the cuff right side out and press it. We will then slip stitch the pressed edge over the seam on the inside of the sleeve. For my slip stitching, I am using the same Gutermann thread I mentioned at the start of the video. I'm also using a number eight darning needle. These are a little longer than regular sharp needles, but I would recommend you use a sharp size eight or 10 for more control over your stitches. Lastly, I have an open top thimble. This thimble was my grandmother's, who was also a seamstress and who also wore her nails long like me. Once that's done, we will top stitch the cuff all the way around. It is finally time to set the sleeves in the blouse. With right sides together, we will first pin the sleeves into the armhole. The double notches will face towards the back and the single notch is facing towards the front. The large circle marking on the sleeve should sit at the shoulder seam of the blouse. We'll have to adjust the ease to fit the sleeve in. 
I personally gathered all of my ease into one spot here at the shoulder seam and I created a very small gathering detail. But you can obviously distribute this ease however you feel more comfortable or you find more aesthetically pleasing. Again, use as many pins as necessary to hold everything in place and making sure there is no fabric bunching on either piece. When the sleeves are secured in place, we can go ahead and stitch them in. First, we will sew around in our regular 1.5 seam allowance. Then we will stitch them again, this time six millimeters away from the initial stitches in the seam allowance. This extra row of stitches is used to reinforce this seam as it can be a seam that has a lot of stress and this makes it last longer. Next, we will trim that down and finish this seam. When pressing, make sure to press the seam toward the sleeve. With that, our sleeves are done and it's time to start working on finishing the blouse. First, we will turn the lower edge of the front cell facing to the outside along the fold line. Then we can stitch that 1.5 centimeters from the lower edge across the cell facing. Finally, we'll trim by cutting away only the self-facing part. When that's done, we can turn the self-facing back to the inside and then we'll make a 1.5 centimeter narrow hem at the lower edge. A narrow hem is also sometimes called a rolled hem and is very commonly used for circular or rounded shapes, but it also can be used for very delicate fabrics. To make a narrow hem, first we will turn up the hem 1.5 centimeters. You may press this or you can just pin that in place. We'll need to ease the fullness where necessary.
Then we can fold the hem in on itself so that the raw edges are tucked away in the hem. Again, you may press or pin that in place. We will stitch the hem catching the self facings at the front of the blouse and finally we'll press that in And at last, it is time for buttons and buttonholes. First, we will need to mark the buttonhole placements. To do this, we will use the buttonhole guide provided in the pattern. It is piece 11. We're going to start by placing the guide on the right front of the blouse, making sure the edges of the pattern piece match the edges of the blouse. Using a fabric marker or chalk, transfer the markings onto the fabric, and then we can make the buttonholes at the markings. To make the buttonholes, you will need to change the presser foot on your sewing machine to a buttonhole presser foot. Then we will change the stitch length to the buttonhole setting and the stitch width to the widest setting. Then using the machine's buttonhole stitches, sew along the markings on the fabric. Once all the front buttonholes are done, we can also go ahead and make the ones on the sleeve cuffs. The markings for the buttonholes on the cuff were on the original pattern piece, so you should have stitch marked them when we did that step. When all the buttonholes are done, carefully open them up with a seam ripper or some fabric scissors. Now all we have to do is sew our buttons in place and our blouse will be finished. First of all, we will need to mark the positions of the buttons. To do this, we can use the buttonholes we just made as a guide. Simply line up the edges of the blouse and the center front markings and use the buttonhole to mark the placement of each button. Then to sew the buttons, we can also do that with our sewing machine. First, we're gonna remove the presser foot then we're going to change our stitch length to zero or lower the grip on the sewing machine plate. You'll also need to change the stitch width to four millimeters and this is a very important part of the process. It has to be four. The last thing you'll need to do is select a zigzag stitch on the machine and you are ready to sew some buttons. Carefully place the button on the marking and make sure that the holes line up with the machine. You want them to be horizontal. Then lower the presser foot so that the button is kept in place. Next, use your hand crank to slowly zigzag stitch the button. If your needle is hitting the button, then you need to change the placement until the needle slides cleanly through the button's holes. When you're happy with the button placement, stitch away. After a few zigzag stitches, do a couple of regular stitches in place to knot off the thread and you're done. So as you can see, this blouse is a really quick and easy project that looks more complicated than it actually is. If you want to see some more vintage and non vintage makes of mine, you can check out my profile on our Minerva.com website 
and you can also create your own account. It's totally free to create an account and it allows you to post videos and photos of all of the things that you're making and tag what materials you're using so that you can help inspire other people. It's also a great place to meet other people that enjoy the same things as you and just to find inspiration in general. If you do end up making this blouse and using this fabric or any other fabric you like, please share that with us and tag us in it so we can see it. It would really make our day. It'd just be so fun to see how you get on with it and you know if you need any help and if you need any advice or anything just pop us a comment and we will get back to you as soon as we can and try to help as much as we can as well thank you so much for watching i hope you enjoyed this video and i will see you in the next one bye